So why is it important to look at cultural representations of other animals? Why is it important for us as animal rights activists? Why am I addressing this at this conference? I'm going to start with a little bit of theory first, um, only a couple of, of slides, but it is, it is important to frame this issue. Um, I like to explain it with the term cultural hegemony. That was a term that was coined by the Italian activist and theorist Antonio Gramsci in the beginning of the 20th century. So Gramsci realized that in order to create and maintain a new society, we not, we not only need to seize control over and to make changes on the political, the military, and on the economic front, but we also need to create and maintain a new consciousness, a new culture. So the state also uses cultural institutions to maintain power in capitalist societies. It imposes a cultural hegemony. And this not only refers to culture with a big C, you know, the culture, the paintings and the theater and the ballet and everything, but much more to our everyday culture, the norms and mores and discourses that make up our everyday lives. So that culture refers to a set of values, norms, perceptions, beliefs, and sentiments that guide us in what is supposedly right and wrong, what is ugly and beautiful, what is normal and necessary, traditional, possible, and impossible, and so on. And those in power decide what is the appropriate culture. The ruling class, the economic and political elite, they have a hegemony of the culture. They decide what is normal and natural and so forth. So those values, norms, beliefs and perceptions then become the common sense values of everyone, particularly those subordinated by it, the oppressed, without the oppressed often even fully realizing that they are living the culture of the ruling class because it is presented as common sense, as something normal. So the power of cultural hegemony lies very much in its invisibility. So the state, um, Gramsci defined this as a, a very broad concept, not only the government that is traditionally thought of when you say the word state, but very broad, everything what uses coercion and achieves consent. And it also refers to the animal industrial complex, for example. And coercion is brought about through the political society on the one hand, so through the army, through the police, through the legal system. And consent uh, is brought about through the civil society, through family, education, and popular media. So that common sense is constantly transforming itself. It also constantly, uh, consent needs to be rewon. There is a constant struggle to establish the common sense through the formation also of counter narratives. So cultural hegemony applied to animal representations then. Um, this is then the cultural hegemony established by what Barbara Noska has called the animal industrial complex. And speciesist beliefs about other animals are firmly established through such discursive practices. For example, the belief that other animals are consumable, that they are food, and that is seen as not only as acceptable, but eating other animals is also considered necessary and normal. So media, images, advertisements, toys, and so forth, they shape the public discourses on other animals. And species yet language, which I will talk about in the second part of my presentation, is a central aspect of discourse through which power is reproduced. Now here are a couple of examples of speciesist cultural representations of animals. The first uh, a couple of examples are um, how the political society through coercion shapes that so-called common sense. Uh, so this is, yeah, you, you probably all know this example, the animal industrial complex wants to prohibit the use of words like sausage and burger for vegan products. Now, uh, they want it to only be reserved for animal-based products. And the reasoning behind this is that, oh yeah, this could lead to confusion for the consumer because maybe they will take a vegan burger by accident while they actually wanted to have a, an, an, an animal-based product. But of course, um, Confusion is, uh, is not really the reason, it's because of economic reasons that they feel they are being under uh, attack and that they uh, are, will uh, suffer economic losses. A similar example is about the use of the word milk. Uh, of the word milk. 
uh, that it should only be reserved for animal-based milk, mother milk from cows, goats, sheep, but that uh, for plant-based milks like soy and almond, uh, the word milk cannot be used. This is already the case in the European Union and there are similar proposals in the United States. Another example of the political society uh, 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 using coercion is uh, the famous ag-ag laws in the United States, in certain states of the United States, uh, which are criminalizing undercover investigations on farms, and not only the undercover investigation on farms, but for example also make it uh, illegal to film standing on public property and filming what happens in a farm that you can see from on the public road. So the animal industrial complex is controlling the images that come into the public eye. They are determining the public image of farming. Here are other examples of popular media, of advertising, uh, so examples of consent in civil society. Uh, this was um, um, a frame that I saw uh, in a shop in, in Valkenburg in the Netherlands. So it says, uh, on top is a chicken, and it says, has the words egg, then pig, bacon, sheep, wool, cow, milk. So it's reducing animals to the products they supposedly give us. I, I put give in quotation, quotation marks, of course, because they don't give us anything, we take it from them. And on the right is a screenshot from a, a video, that a promotional video that was shown in the poultry museum in, um, I think it was Barneveld in the Netherlands, um, really uh, portraying the chickens as happy animals. Um, uh, so in the mo it says there, in the morning when the light goes on, I'm looking for a place to lay my egg, uh, to lay my egg, and all the chickens are looking very happy, and yeah, laying eggs is, is just like a normal part uh, of, of the day. Some other examples, I'm going really a, a bit fast over these because I have a lot to show you. This is uh, a an, an brochure of children, uh, first grade children to visit the farm, so presenting uh, a, a quite, um, um, presenting a farm as a place where uh, chickens juggle with their eggs. Um, the famous images of chickens on market stalls, you've all seen these, portraying them as happy animals, willingly serving their own body parts. There are so many examples that you see in everyday life. Um, if you, for example, Google the term suicide food, you, you find so many images uh, of animals, uh, as it were, uh, serving themselves, as you see here, the chicken serving herself uh, as food. Um, the examples on on transport trucks with cartoons of pigs, and here there is also, of course, the link with sexism. And Carolina Scauron talked about that yesterday. The objectification of both women and other animals is another aspect here. Um, yeah, and anybody who ever gets a chance to see the the presentation, also the sexual politics of meat by Carol J. Adams, uh, I, I strongly recommend that. Who goes into those connections between sexism? Sexism and speciesism. Yeah, these are some other ex examples of a spam of the sexual politics of meat. I won't go into these now. Another example I saw this in a in a shop uh, in a kitchen supply shop. That's a thermometer to put into food while the food is being cooked. Um, so it depicts the temperature at which these animals should be cooked. Um, Presenting animals as cuts of meat, so reducing them to their edible body parts, um, objectifying animals, that is. Um, Slicey the pig, this is called, and this is actually a dashboard wriggler, so this is something people can put on their dashboard, and then the pig constantly wriggles if you drive with a car. So a lot, apparently a lot of people find this very funny. Um, children's books, uh, classic examples of how the speciesist ideology is installed in children. Um, this is one in French, and the first sentence there reads, the farmer raises cows because they give milk, presenting uh, the idea, entrenching in children the idea, yeah, that the animals, they give milk, but of course they don't give milk, we take it from them. This is another example of a Portuguese children's book about the dairy industry, presenting it as a very idyllic um, scene. And we all know that the dairy farm uh, looks anything uh, like it's depicted here in this children's book. Now, um, 
this is a, um, yeah, let's say it's a small experiment. It's not really an experiment, but uh, when you hear the word salmon, what do you think about? What is the image that you have in your mind? Just picture that for a moment. Um, so, is it more? Is it, is it actually the fish that you think about? Is that the first image that came up into your mind? Um, some yes, some no's. Um, or was it more something like this that you had in your mind? So this is actually vegan salmon. I'll talk more about the language later on. Let's just call it vegan salmon now. Um, so um, some people will, uh, when they hear the word salmon, I think the general public immediately thinks about the picture on the right and don't think about the actual, the actual individual fish. Another example, um, okay, these are, uh, to make the point, when you type the word salmon into Google Images, these are the results that I get, and there's actually only one picture of a living, of, I don't know actually whether the salmon depicted there is actually living, but there's only one image there of actually the fish. All the others are of the body parts of the salmon, cooked salmon, prepared salmon. Another example, scampis or shrimp. What is the image that comes up into your mind? Is it more something, uh, the living animal that you see? Do you, do you actually, a lot of people maybe don't even know that shrimp or scampis look like this? Um, or is it more something like this? These are also vegan scampis, um, and I like them a lot. They are very good, but that's not the point of my presentation. It's what image comes up in your mind when I say the word scampis or shrimp or in the general public's mind. Another one to make the point, the word turkey. What do you think about? Is it an image like this that comes up of the individual animal, the turkey? Or is it more something, or is it of the cooked, prepared, beheaded, uh, and the feathered uh, bird? That's also vegan turkey. So um, I think you, you kind of, um, get the idea where I'm heading with this. Um, it's about yeah the, the, the vegan products in the shape of animals. Um, I have an, uh, some other examples. Um, this is vegan chicken. We ate that in a restaurant in, in New York it was, and was like a half, uh, half a chicken with, with a piece of the, the, the leg on it. And it even had an imprint of wire mesh to make it look as realistic as, as possible. That is a vegan lobster. The photo is not so, so good because it was still in the package. I didn't buy it. It was in a shop uh, in Den Haag, a vegan shop in Den Haag. Uh, vegan lobster. This is, uh, this is a, a vegan chocolatier who um, sells a vegan turkey, but not turkey like the living animal, like uh, I saw the, uh, I, I showed you the picture before, but actually the, the carcass, the body of a beheaded and defeathered uh, turkey. And you can stuff that uh, chocolate turkey with ice cream. And on top also you uh, see a lamb and you can also stuff the, the lamb with ice cream. And on, on the left photo, those um, round shapes are actually supposedly uh, legs of turkeys that you can also fill with uh, ice cream. So the point is, when people hear the word turkey, shrimp, or salmon, um, they should make the association with living sentient beings, I think, not cooked or grilled body parts of those animals. So I'm talking here about so-called meat replacers or fish replacers. I will elaborate more about those terms in a moment, who are in the shape of animals uh, or are in the shape of a part of an animal, like a chicken leg or a turkey body. And I'm not talking about burgers or sausages here. I will discuss those later on. Now, I want to be very clear. Um, I very much agree that all those products can be very delicious. That's not my point. And I know that some vegans or even non-vegans are looking for products that resemble the taste of meat or fish or even long for that taste. So it's not because one becomes vegan for animal rights that one cannot miss the taste of something. And I also very much agree that these products are very practical alternatives to veganized traditional dishes like vegan vol au vent or paella or stew and so along. And they are mostly very easy to prepare. 
and also the fact that they are very recognizable mm, that um, can it can make people try these products or or for example when gram, grandma wants to make a vegan meal for her granddaughter and she says oh this, this, i have to make something vegan this uh, some of these products will be easier for her than for example if she has to prepare a dish with tempeh or tofu that she has never worked with and that she doesn't know what to do so I realize all these things, but although no animals are used or abused for these products, because they are vegan, they are plant-based, by giving them that animal-shaped appearance or form, I think we are still stuck in a speciesist mind frame. Other animals are still seen, they are normalized as object, as something consumable. So by presenting a chicken as a beheaded and a defeathered chicken, by presenting a chip, scampi or lobster as a cooked and peeled shrimp. By presenting a turkey as a beheaded and defeathered turkey. So these are the shapes of brutally abused and sometimes boiled life animals. These are exactly the practices that we are advocating against, that we want to end. So why do we persist on presenting food in such horrible shapes? Why do we find such food shapes acceptable? These, in my opinion, these should be the shapes that we relegate to the history books. Um, so... Um, I feel that although they may be a handy and possible even an effective way to get people to try vegan food, they still reproduce a speciesist mind frame and are not effective in dismantling speciesism in the long run. Um, okay, and I know, I know that some people will reply, uh, but no animals are actually killed for those vegan lobsters or for the vegan turkeys, and yes, that's true. But I want to set it along uh, some other examples to make the point. Uh, so, for example, this is a hunting place that's, that's made of yeah, plastic, uh, presumably, uh, mostly. Would you give children these as a toy? Because it doesn't involve any real animals, neither. But by giving this as a toy to children, you for frame their mind, you form their mind uh, into seeing animals as, as beings that can be shot, that, uh, that can be hunted. The same for these toys. This is a, a hunting truck with little figures, uh, even shooting at the animals. Um, I'm, I'm going fast over this. This is a, a, a play set uh, presenting, uh, represent, it's a butcher shop so that the children can play butcher. Uh, here also a Barbie doll uh, playing chicken farmer with, with chickens and with collecting the eggs and everything. And um, playing a butcher actually with a knife, with, with, with a pig uh, along. This is a miniature slaughterhouse. Um, this is used in landscapes for people playing with miniature trains. So although it's advertised as being for over 14 years old, but I can imagine that many younger children also help set up with this and, and play with it. So what is the image that we are giving children with these kinds of, of uh, toys? Another example, the uh, um, bull fighting arena or circus with animals used for entertainment. Um, these are video games in which children learn how to exploit animals, um, that they have to milk the cows, that they have to impregnate the cows every time to get uh, milk. So another example, a setup of a farm. Now, all of these, these are all just toys or plastic setups, and they don't involve any actual killing or harming of other animals, but it does learn children or even adults to, adults to think about other animals in a certain way. It shapes their ideas about other animals as usable products, as commodities, as tradable goods, as consumable goods. And I feel, so that's the point I wanted to make with those examples, with those comparisons, I feel this is the same for the so-called fake meat products, like vegan turkey, vegan scampi, and vegan salmon. Now, uh, also, if you, if you want to learn more about... Um, how the imagery shapes the minds of children. I strongly work, uh, recommend the, the, the work of Matthew Cole and Kate Stewart. So these sociologists, they have researched the way children are shaped by images. Um, so their book is called Our Children and Other Animals, if you want to look into that. Now, 
the vegan shrimp, the vegan fish, and so forth, they are not the same as sausages, burger, pastry, vegan cheese, or slices, because burgers and sausages are forms of preparation. They have that shape or form because it is an easy way to prepare, to bake, or cook, or grill, or spread on bread even. Um, I always say uh, it's easier to bake a burger than a cube, or a triangle, or a star-shaped form. Uh, but yeah, of course, because that's a shape that we put uh, in the pan. And that's an often heard remark from non-vegans, but why do these vegan products always need to look like meat? Um, now, uh, I do think they, those making that remark that they do have a point with respect to the vegan scampi and the vegan shrimp and the vegan turkey and such, but I don't think they have a point with respect to burgers, sausages and such, because, um, yeah, to say it, there are no sausages or burgers on four poles running around in the pasture. They're, they, they, they are just food shapes, preparation shapes. I have a couple of other examples of uh, representations of ana animals. Um, this is uh, the Barnum's Animals cookie box um, that has existed for, I think, a hundred years or something. And, yeah, the cookie box has always been like, like this, um, a box like that, and it represents um, a, a carriage, a wagon, a circus wagon in which animals are transported to the circus, and it used to be um, sold even with, uh, with cords so that children could attach them to the box and carry the box around, so playing uh, like the circus is coming to town and, and carrying the animals around, the animals, the animal cookies in the box. Uh, so like a circus wagon with animals. So the, there was protest against this from animal rights groups precisely for the reasons that I explained before. Um, so now the, the cookie box no longer has bars um, and it's no longer with supposedly wheels. It's no longer like a, a circus wagon, but it's um, so not longer giving the image of animals being caged, but animals running freely on the savanna. Now... Um, these cookies, uh, I think they are actually vegan, I believe. Um, but there are some sociologists do, who do think that animal cookies in itself are also, um, that they, that that also consolidates a speciesist mind frame. That by collecting animal, co animal shaped cookies, by literally breaking them, uh, that that supposedly entrenches an objectifying view on animals. Now, I'm still not quite sure where I stand on this, but I think they may have a point. It all depends on how the shapes are presented, I think, how realistic they are or not, and in what context they are presented. Like, for example, if you have these cookie shapes, I do think that is problematic because it presents a horse as, uh, as something or as a being, uh, who is being ridden on. It, it presents a horse as a racing horse. The other one, those are all molds, and they are uh, molds for, for cookies or for pastry, and they uh, are part of a collection of animals on the farm. So it's like um, already saying that these are all farm animals, and these are all animals for us to use on a farm. So I think uh, those such images, such shapes, cookie shapes, can indeed be uh, problematic. Um, also note how the cow is depicted there with a large udder. I will come back to that um, in a minute. This is an example. Uh, I don't know whether this is a tradition in other countries, but in Belgium it is, or it, it was more in the past. I think it's, it's dying out now more. And this is something that is uh, served on the first or second communion of children. Um, the, so the, the Christian tradition, the Catholic tradition, and um, for the dessert, the child then stabs a knife in the neck of the lamb, and then red sauce pours out. So it has to do with the sacrifice of the lamb. Um, and I've seen vegans asking on forums, yeah, where can I get a vegan lamb for my communion of my child? And I think, yeah, that's a really bad idea, I think, because that, um, although it's, it's not a real lamb, you know, it's, it's, it can be vegan ice cream with vegan sauce, but it makes them think about lambs in a certain way, of course. Um, and about the, the, the cows, I wanted to say something about lar uh, large other. It's, it's remarkable that cows are very often um, depicted even in, in vegan cartoons and so with such large others. Now, 
Of course, I realized because of um, dairy farming throughout the, the years, the, other ch the others have grown disproportionately. But on the other hand, by focusing, by always depicting them with an other, while other animals also have others, you know, a donkey also has an other, a sheep also has an other, but in images you never see the other of those animals. But for cows, we, we also, we always, uh, depict the other and i think that's a, a species is thinking it it focuses on on that one functionality of cows giving milk so we should be careful not reproducing that speciesist mindset another example the probably you've all heard of um, the circus i think it was in germany who uh, now is no longer using real animals in the circus but have developed holograms and they give a show with holograms of animals so a team of engineers has has fabricated the whole show a great idea no longer using live animals of course i think that's a great idea um I can only go from a couple of snippets of, of video material that I show that I saw on on YouTube. But one of the images that I saw was uh, moving images was actually the elephant doing a trick, performing a trick, and standing on her or his uh, front leg. So like elephants used to do, or in some cases still do, um, in circuses for entertainment. So I do think this is problematic. Although no real animals are used, I do think this is still reproducing the idea that animals are there for us for entertainment. If it would be holograms with animals living freely in their natural environment, that would be giving a totally different idea than presenting them as doing tricks for us. Um, and to make an, an, an analogy, um, I know we have to be careful with analogies. I'll, I'll say something more about that. But I want to make an analogy in the 19th century and in the beginning of the 20th century, there were road shows and road shows, and there were so-called freak shows in which disabled people also performed tricks. So um, it was they they sometimes forcibly, but sometimes they also uh, did this as a means as as so as getting a job, as having an income. But if we make the analogy, would we find it acceptable? Those are the road, the freak shows are now a thing of the past. But would we find it acceptable to uh, make holograms of disabled people performing tricks and then showing that in a circus-like uh, ring? Uh, I think that's very ableist. So um, in the same way, I think uh, presenting animals in the holograms and performing tricks for us is very is is is. That's a very speciesist mind frame. Now about the, the analogy, I know this is, um, I cannot go further into it now, but I know um, I'm not using this as a prop to, to, um, to further the, the animal rights cause, you know, um, about the analogies, about the, the interconnections between ableism and speciesism. I have recently launched a platform, Crip Humanimal, and there I'm, I'm exploring on, on these topics and I also recommend you to read the book uh, Beast of Burton by Sonara Taylor. So uh, that's I, I really wanted to mention that. Um, there are similarities in the oppressions of disabled people and animals, but there are also many differences. Another example, the, these are photos that I took in Ikea. Of dreadful that you then stumble across the, the sheep skins and the cow skins. And then um, I saw this. Um, so it online, and these are bat covers. I presume there are in cotton, so probably no animal products involved. But I also think this this can be problematic because it doesn't refer to the animal in a whole. It, it immediately makes you think about an animal's skin, about cow's skin. So that's why I think it's problematic. Um, the same about shoes. I saw these shoes just last week. And they are, they don't use any animal products. Well, I don't know about the glue, but uh, the lining and so is, is not, um, of animal skin, but it has an, a snake pattern. It's like it's made from snake uh, skin. And so that reproduces the idea that we can use snake skin for uh, such uh, materials for, for shoes. The same for fake leather, um, and fake fur. If it really resembles, the, the animals, I think that is uh, problematic. 
Okay, this was a tiger chained in front of an Asian restaurant. Uh, I'll just skip this one. And this is also from a couple of weeks ago, and I posted this myself on my page, and uh, I, I, I was really excited to see this. I thought, oh yeah, that's so much better than a real uh, deer head on the wall. It's so... Uh, and I also posted it as such, but as I w was preparing my presentation, I started to reconsider, actually, because it made me wonder if, if this image also doesn't... Um, reproduce that image again of we are putting uh, the head of a, an animal against uh, up on the wall. So if that isn't, isn't actually also again reproducing that speciesist mindset. Hmm. Okay, so those were a couple of examples of images. The second part is about language use. Um, so speciesism not only blatantly manifests itself in the way we interact with other animals, how we treat them and how they are represented in cultural images, but also in how we speak about them. Language is often an expression of a speciesist ideology and in itself then speciesist language can further consolidate or entrench that speciesist thinking. Animals are often objectified through language, they are set apart from humans or their individuality is ignored. So language is a very powerful, powerful tool. As it says on, on the slide, words have power. And through the use of speciesist language, speciesist power relations are perpetuated and reinforced. So applying alternative non-speciesist language is a means of making the hidden victimization of other animals visible, of challenging that cultural hegemony by which I started the presentation. Um, so I'm going to give a couple of examples of speciesist language and possible alternatives. Now the word animals in itself. Um, in our words we often underline the difference between humans and animals. And traditionally the noun animals is used to refer to all animals except humans. So denying the fact that humans are animals too. And by using humans and animals, humans are set apart and against to all other animal species. But what is the alternative then? Um, I'm really not in favor of using the term non-human animals. I know that is used a lot, but I try to avoid it. Uh, I, I hope I haven't used it, but normally I, I, I try really not to use that because it is defining animals through a negation with regard to the defining characteristic human. So the human realm is still employed as a yardstick with other animals classified as definitely not belonging to that separate special human realm. I think it actually further consolidates, consolidates speciesism by defining animals, but what they are not. They are not human. And I think, uh, to make an analogy, I think it would be the same like referring to women as non-male humans. So we wouldn't say that about women. So why do we say about animals that they are non-human animals? I prefer to use the term, uh, the terminology humans and other animals. So when I did my research many years ago uh, in criminology, I used the term animals other than human animals throughout my dissertation, and I used the acronym AOTAS, animals other than human animals. Now I know this is, yeah, this, it is for a part more like an academic um, exercise because I know in everyday language, it's very difficult to use those alternatives consistently and, and always. And I also know that there are other alternatives proposed, um, like Lisa Kemmerer, uh, she, she uses animal. Um, each alternative has its pros and cons, and I, I hardly ever use aotas in, in spoken language, although sometimes in written language I will use it, but more written out, animals other than human animals. And I certainly also realize that throughout my presentation here today, I have not been consistent at all, and I have often used animals to refer to aotas. Because yeah, it's one thing to identify species as language, but it's yet another thing to actually try to stop using it in practice. That's very difficult. Another uh, example of species as language is a higher and lower animals or advanced and primitive species, because each animal species, or even plant species for that matter, is the result of an evolutionary path of millions of years uh, so leading to the way a certain species exists today. A bat is not higher than a whale or an ant or a sheep or, or whatever species. This is a, an anecdote. You, you probably all know who this is. This is Jane Goodall, the, the famous primatologist working with the chimpanzees of Gombe. And when, when she first uh, submitted one of her first research papers to uh, an academic journal, 
and she had uh, written down all the names of the chimpanzees because she had named them. That was also not done in that period because it was not scientific, not objective enough. And she had she also referred to them as he or she instead of what is normally used in in language it because it and the nouns and pronouns it which that those are used for objects and in language uh, animals are seen as object and she didn't use um, the chimpanzee uh, that went into the forest but she wrote down the chimpanzee who went into the forest um, she didn't write it went away for the afternoon she she wrote he went away for the afternoon, he took a banana, she climbed in a tree. So she didn't use it or which, but he or she and who, because they are someone, not something. And she got uh, the paper back with revisions and all the he's and she's, they were all taken out and replaced by, by it's and, and that. But she persisted and she changed them again. And so um, she, that was probably one of the first papers where the animals were actually seen as, as individuals, as, as living beings and not as living things. So through language, we can make animals visible. Um, in our language, other animals are, are sometimes made invisible or the individuality is, take, individuality is taken away from them. For example, when you say he is eating fish, that's really abstract. When we say he is eating a fish, or even more specifically, uh, say the name of, of the fish species, he is eating a salmon, we, we make the animals visible. Instead of saying they are eating meat, they are eating a pig. She is eating turkey, she is eating a turkey. So make the animals visible. Um, a different name is also employed for the living animal and the consumed animal. So a cow becomes beef or steak and a pig is turned into pork or bacon. Calves are renamed as veal. Sheep become mutton and goats become chevron. And further down the line, the animal's origin is even more obscured through labors as hot dogs, hamburgers, drumsticks, uh, sauce, uh, escalope, pepperoni, volovan. So animals are in that matter not only literally turned into chunks of flesh, but they are also metaphorically renamed to conceal the relationship of these body parts with their living and sentient origin, an individual animal. So animals are turned into what Carol Adams has called the absent referent. They are absent because they are dead. So the living animal has ceased to exist. And they are also made absent through the language we apply to describe the consumption of animals other than human animals. Their names are concealed through wordings as meat, beef, bacon, and hamburger. Another example of speciesist language, the euphemisms we use for actions towards animals like harvesting, sacrificing, culling, processing, destroying, putting to sleep, putting down, or even euthanasia are actually euphemisms for killing. That is what they are, they, they, it's killing. So by using the personalized verbs to refer to a very personal practice, the act of killing is neutralized and speciesistically framed. The killing is concealed, but harvesting is killing. Harvesting is actually a term that is, or harvesting or sacrificing are terms that are often used in research papers uh, um, using um, animals for experimental research. Uh, another example, yeah, beak trimming, it, it sounds like almost like you're trimming a hedge or something, but it's actually the beaking, cutting off the beak of uh, birds. So-called food products. Um, yeah, instead of milk, talk about cow's milk or cow's mother milk or cow's secretions. Um, now the terminology meat replacer or fake meat, I talked about that in the beginning of the presentation. I think that these... Um, these terms reveal the central and dominant place of meat in a traditional diet. It's like if meat, like meat needs to be replaced and meat is then seen as the real food and plant-based food is seen as a sort of subordinate substitute. Um, I, I also find it problematic when, when people then say, when, oh, I've, tated, I've tasted this vegan cheese and it tastes just as good like the real thing because the real th we don't want people to think about animal-based cheese as the real thing. We want people to think about vegan cheese, about vegan products as the real thing. So 
think about that when you say preferably don't refer to the animal-based foods as the real thing. So these meat replacers, they are not only problematic with respect to their shape, as I pointed out before, but also with respect to their name. So in, instead of, I, I've only been doing this like uh, a year or so, I used to call them vegan shrimp and vegan chicken and tofu fish. I also use that terminology, but I don't do anymore. Now I try to uh, use the name, of the ingredients, what it's made of. So for example, vegan shrimp are often made of cognac meal, and then I say cognac rolls. Um, vegan chicken is often made of soy, so I say these are soy pieces. Tofu fish, um, I, I have a dish that I put them in nori uh, leaves, uh, so I say th those are nori rolls. Um, this is not the same as words like omelette, burger, or sausage. As like I said, those are just food shapes or modes of, proper, of preparation. The categorizing and labeling of animals. Um, we, we talk about farm animals and companion animals and laboratory animals, and it's like animals are born with such labels. But those labels, those categorizations are human inventions, of course. We give them that function and place in the order of things. So instead of farm animals, I, I prefer to talk about farmed animals or farmed other animals, or as I did in my dissertation, it was farmed iotas that I talked about. Instead of companion animals, I talk about animal companions. Um, with that respect about animal con companions, don't speak about his boss or his owner, but preferably talk about the caretaker of the animals. Um, another category, lab animals. Um, I prefer to talk about animals who are used in lab experiments or circus animals, animals who are used for entertainment. Yep. Uh, yeah, this was another example of the food products, actually, the, the so-called meat replacers. This is actually the menu of uh, a vegan restaurant. You wouldn't say so if you... Uh, it's in Dutch, I'm sorry. But um, it says chicken with cashew nuts and sesame oil, chicken with Thai basil sauce, chicken with spicy XO sauce, and then further down the line, fish and spicy tomato seaweed sauce, fish and dry pepper sauce, further also bacon and shrimp, lamb, lamb's meat is also mentioned, so you get the idea. Um, if you wouldn't know this was in a vegan restaurant, um, well, it's in... Uh, it's nearly all vegan the restaurant. There are a couple of vegetarian options. But if you wouldn't know this, you would be thinking that you're just in a traditional restaurant. And this is, and I know the reasoning behind it. You know, I talked about it in the beginning. Uh, I know this is more effective. It can bring people to try these foods and it, it's recognizable. But we, I think we really need a, a shift in our thinking and move away from this and, and don't perpetuate that, that speciesist thinking. I think this, is, this still has an, uh, an aspect of speciesism in it. Um, yeah, this was a screenshot. Um, instead of uh, using the word zoo, use prison. That's from the, the Simpsons, of course. Um, I'll run through this um, a, a little bit quicker because uh, I need to round up then. Um, the animalizing humans, um, these are different terms that are used for humans and other animals. So for example, for humans we talk about hair, but for other animals, traditionally we talk about fur or wool, but actually it's also the hair. For humans we talk about skin, but for other animals traditionally we talk about hide or, or leather then. The same corpses, carcasses. So we could make a point that we use the same uh, words that we use for humans also for other animals. Animals as insults. But animals aren't insults, so don't use them in a derogatory way. Uh, this devaluates animals. So terms like, uh, uh, sayings like, don't be a rat, bird brain, he's such a dog, what a pig. Those are, I, I think they, they are problematic. And also a lot of the sayings and proverbs. Of course, language is a, is a, represents how we, how we think about other animals. And of course, it's normal that a lot of the, of the actions that we do to, traditionally have done to animals have found their way into the saying and proverbs for example killing two birds with one stone leading being like uh, let like lambs to the slaughter um, but if we want to move to a non-speciesist society to non-speciesist thinking i think we can make we can provide alternatives for those sayings and and move away from this other examples are as red as a lobster 
but you know a lobster isn't red naturally it's only red because it's being cooked so whenever somebody says that red as a lobster i think yeah but a lobster isn't red or goosebumps a goose doesn't have bumps naturally it's only because it's been it's been plucked and its feathers uh, her or his feathers have been taken away that that you see the bumps and the final example is about uh, the term voiceless now Animals are not voiceless, and not even metaphorically. So I think this is a very problematic term. And presenting them as voiceless presents them as passive recipients, as having no agency. But they do have agency, and they do resist their oppression. So they have voices, and we should bring their voices into the conversation. We should center the stories and the voices of animals, and not present ourselves as the saviors of other animals. And this is a quote of a... Okay, thanks. This is a quote on that topic by, well, it wasn't actually about um, other animals, but I think it's really fitting. There's really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard by Arundhati Roy. So, um, another, um, I'm not going to read it out loud now because I'm, I'm short for time now, but uh, there's a passage about also about voiceless animal in the book Beast of Burden by Sonora Taylor, why this uh, term is problematic. So, um, um, animals do resist their oppression and they do have voices. And um, I, I see there's a, if you don't know the Facebook page, I suggest you follow it, of animal resistance. It uh, recounts the, the examples in, through which animals show their resistance. And if you look, if you look around, you see plenty of examples that animals resist their oppression. And this was just one example. Maybe the older people in the room remember this. I remember when this was live on TV, when this was shown in the news. This was in 1994. It was on Hawaii. There was Tyke, the elephant, who um, in the circus, and for, she was used for entertainment. She killed her handler during a show, and then she stampeded outside on the streets, and eventually she was shot. So... Um, and like that, there are so many examples of other animals resisting their oppression. They do have a voice. They do let us know that they don't agree with their oppression. And many such examples are written down in the book by Jason Ribble, Fear of the Animal Planet. So if you want to look into that, it's a really good book. And one of the people of the animal resistance uh, who's behind that is Dan Kidby. And this is a slide from his presentation on VecFest uh, in Brighton. I saw it in London last year. and I. He proposes that, I, I asked him if I could use this slide, and he says, yeah, we, the, the commonly used frame, vegan for the animals, is actually problematic, because we also wouldn't say, uh, I'm a feminist for the women. Um, so he, he proposes to use the alternative, um, anti-speciesist in solidarity with other animals. As such, raising the voices of the animals, we are standing in solidarity with them. We should first listen to their voices and center the animals in our, in our movement, in our advocacy. Now I'm rounding up. Um, so um, as we live in a speciesist world, Representations of other animals in images, cultural objects, and in our language, they often reflect that dominant speciesist ideologies. I have given many examples in the beginning. And at the same time, those cultural expressions also shape the way we perceive other animals, and they can entrench that speciesist ideology even further. So it's very important to challenge these speciesist representations, to challenge that speciesist cultural hegemony. Um, and all of this, all of what I talked about, this has, of course, repercussions for the presentations, for the representations that we use in our activism for other animals. So we not only need to challenge those representations that are used by the dominant speciesist complex, by the animal industrial complex, but we must also be aware that we ourselves, that we are not perpetuating such speciesist representations, and we need to offer a counter-narrative a counter hegemony, so we must reshape that common sense that I talked about in the beginning about other animals to break through that speciesist hegemony. So I have given many examples. Um, I'm still finding my way in this as well. So, and I also realize that sometimes I may not have been consistent in my language use. I, I truly realize that. But the whole point of my presentation was, in, in short, is this. 
Think about the images that you use, think about the words that you use, and every time we speak about other animals, every time we use images of other animals, we have either the opportunity to perpetuate that species' thinking, or we can challenge it and offer a counter-narrative to the dominant cultural hegemony. So that was it. Thank you. Thank you.